everybody and happy Science Week. It's Tuesday and Science Week continues and we continue our series of climate heroes in the local Abbey Leaks and Leash region. And tonight the topic is climate action and health. I'm Dr. Neve Shaw. I'm the science communicator in residence for the Climate Action Project uh, in Abbey Leaks. I'm also a science communicator in the real world, as well as a writer and an obsessive on all things space, but that's not relevant tonight. I am joined tonight by a panel uh, equally as, as amazing as last, as last night's. They are Professor Eric Morgan from Queen's University Belfast, who studies the parasites of domestic animals and how climate change is impacting on them and other animals and how that can have a knock-on effect on our food supply. I'm also joined by Ailish Fitzpatrick of Black Hill Woods Yoga Retreat, who will be talking about sustainable living. And lastly, Father Paddy Byrne, the parish priest of Abbey Leaks, and who is very engaged in social media and on national media with a personal interest in mental health and the positive impact of nature on our sense of well-being. Also joining us is Catherine Casey, the amazing Catherine Casey from Leash uh, Heritage Office for Leash County Council, and Anne Lawler from Creative Leash. And Catherine is here with us in the Zoom room, and Anne is keeping an eye on things from Facebook Live, and they will be moderating any questions and feeding them back into the room. So, Catherine, I might ask you to just explain what the Abbey Leaks Climate Action Plan is, our project, and, and then when, when people have context of what this is all about, then we can get going with our panel event tonight. Great. Thanks, Neve. I'm, I'm delighted, like yourself, to welcome our panellists and our viewers this evening to the Local Heroes panel discussion on climate action. This is the second of the three panels we're having this week, focusing this time on health, as you said. We're having a different aspect of climate change and how local people are taking action. We're delighted to welcome yourself, Neve, on board as our science communicator, working with Abilix Tidy Towns, to spread the message about climate change. Between now and next March, we'll be working with Abilix Tidy Towns and our friends in Creative Ireland and in Midland Science to really engage people with the communication side of climate change. To a large extent, I think we were talking last night about David Attenborough's new programme and how he talked about um, we know what needs to be done, we know what the problem is, but a lot of what we, what we need to do now is a communications issue whether that's communicating with politicians or leaders or the public, we know what we need to do. So now we have to get the message out there. So our sincere thanks to Creative Ireland Leash, as I said, the Creative Ireland programme nationally and to our colleagues in Midland Science for the support of this project and for the help in putting together this event this week. Uh, many people will know, just to mention as well, that it's uh, Midland Science Festival is going on all this week for Science Week. And anybody who wants to can check out midlandscience.ie for details of the great events they have there for the remainder of this week. And our thanks to Jackie and Gillian from Midland Science um, for their, their great help this weekend and all year. We're just at the start of the process, as you said, in Abelix. We'd really like to encourage anybody who'd like to get involved to communicate us here on the Facebook page or on the project email at climateaction at leashcoco.ie. Thanks, Neve. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. So, so just to give you context about why the Climate Heroes um, panel events are happening this week. So, Leash has been busy tackling climate change at a local level for a number of years now through a range of community activities. And, and it was important for us to highlight that, highlight that this week and let those of you who aren't aware of it but about what's happening in your region. And hopefully by profiling these heroes on our panel discussions as part of Midland Science Festival, we can involve you, we can bring you in more and, and figure out how you can get involved in all of these projects and perhaps more about tackling climate action. And um, so, yeah, so, so let's start talking to um, our guests that we have, have tonight. So, Eric, um, I just introduced you there. So you, you, you work in parasitology and, and food security. So can you just tell us how that relates to climate change? Yeah, certainly, and thanks for inviting me. So I'm a vet by training. I'm a parasitologist, so I suppose an obsessive on all things parasitic worm which is not quite as glamorous as space, but it's quite important because the worms, particularly in livestock, uh, affect our food production very much. Uh, there are also species that affect companion animals and wildlife and people also. Uh, and uh, the relevance of climate change is that these parasites have to change between hosts and they spend some time in the environment and are very susceptible to the effects of temperature, humidity and rainfall. So any change in climate is going to shift the opportunities for parasite transmission and, and the disease burden. Um, it's a big problem internationally. So I've spent the last two days uh, chairing an international scientific meeting on climate change and animal disease. But that's that's where the talk happens. That's not where the action happens. So I'm really delighted that you're holding this event to really get local engagement in climate action. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, 
Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, that's what it's about, isn't it? Like starting from the ground up and, and engaging people and just giving them the power to be a part of it. And Eilish, how do you connect then your, I know that you've got that beautiful yoga retreat out in Black Hill, Black Hill Woods. How does that connect for you with climate action? Hi, Neil, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, look, really great to be a part of this. Yoga is just a way of uniting everything. The word by its definition is union and to unite. So um, we try to li live what we believe in our small ways and try to live more consciously and live a positive, simple life. We, we lived a very crazy fast lives. We didn't get in a straight line to being a yoga teacher. You don't put down under CAO form. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually the big meandering curve of a stressful life that leads you to be actually, you need to slow down. You need to need to calm down so um we try to share that um obviously this year it's predominantly online but we um welcome people to our home for little retreats for classes for weekend retreats and um we try to just share that with a space space and peace so they can find it within themselves like we firmly believe the planet and ourselves are inextricably linked. Healthy humans equals healthy planet. So if we're minding ourselves, then it will start to filter outwards and it will have a ripple effect on it, all the decisions that you make. So it seems very simple and very small, but it has the potential to be really profound. If you're happy and minding yourself, not that you have to be 100% happy all the time, but if you're in a good place, you're more likely to make good decisions for everything. You know, so yeah. it is all connected, all connected, all union yoga. <laughs> well, it makes sense, you know, and I do think the way we live, we've kind of we have disconnected because we are being pushed so hard to be more productive. And certainly with the with the lockdown, I think we, we're online more and more and more. And and that line of of, you know, work life balance is definitely being tipped, certainly for me, you know, and I'm sure for, for many other people. And Father Paddy, then as a parish priest, you're you're out in the community and you're meeting all kinds of people. Um, how does how does how does climate action connect with you in terms of in terms of your work? Well, again, uh, just it's lovely to be with you and uh, to support um, climate action. And indeed, uh, I think just as a, as a fellow brother to humanity, uh, to feel connected uh, is so important. Um, I think my role ultimately is about people. Um, and I agree with what our my friend there from Black Hill has just outlined. I think a happy mind brings with it right balance. And when we have balance within ourselves, I think we're more in tune with that gift of creation. And I suppose I'm spiritual. Uh, we're all, I believe we all have a spiritual energy. And that energy, I think, connects me to people and to the environment and uh, for instance you know I, I really think that groups in Abbey Leaks like the Climate Action Group like Tidy Towns like the wonderful biodiversity that's really in real consciousness when we're down in the local bog when you see green flags in our schools uh, I think I think people including myself we search for meaning and purpose in life and I think we find that in I just presented a little hyacinth here very front. nice we we find it in the simple things and yet this simple hyacinth is far more profoundly inspiring and complex in its whole outlook perhaps than I ever will be but creation is gift and I think bottom line as a Christian as well uh, care of environment is key to to what I'm about yeah and then following on from that you know the topic of tonight's session is climate action and health so if I were to ask you that what springs to mind what what connects for you when you hear that in relation to the work that you do or the work that needs to be done well, I think, you see, it's not a heady subject. And I think maybe that's what the problem with, with creating awareness around climate action is, that it can become intellectualized. But just to give a little personal testimony, I suppose in my head, I understood a lot about climate change, about the need for to become more, as an individual, to contribute to the well-being of Mother Nature. But it was through Mother Nature where I experienced a lot of personal healing in my life. Uh, I lost a brother about 15 years ago, tragically, and found it very hard to be able to cope with that. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in my life as a young man, I found healing by planting, by actually getting out, growing vegetables, by planting uh, nice plants, and just by digging deeper into the earth. About three years ago, I had a health issue myself, 
and uh, thankfully was 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 quite treatable. It wasn't. It was really probably because we're talking living in fifth gear as opposed to now in second gear, and thinking everything revolved around me. And it wasn't until I had to physically remove myself for some time from ministry, just for a few weeks to get well, that I actually discovered, God, there's pathways. My God, there's rivers. There's forests. Look at this. This is a tree. Oh, my God, I can actually walk five kilometers after two months. My God, I can run five kilometers. That I think if we're in sync, meditation, yoga... Uh, just it sounds a bit crazy maybe the energy that comes from grass from just literally putting your hand on that gift of nature and allowing it to speak to us it actually helps us get well so improving climate improves our body uh, it improves our well-being and it's again so in tune what's the first line of the bible i don't want to be preachy here but the first line of the bible is god create in the beginning God created and somehow there is that creative energy and force of goodness calling us to always rejuvenate to be responsible in allowing not just my generation but those in the future to live in a good place in an environment where we can all blossom and we can achieve wonderful things through calmness through mindfulness through that ability of being nourish, nourishing our inner selves, because mm. when we're well within, then we can actually see the beauty of the change of the environment around us. That's so true. You're right. And, and of course, to have a healthy environment, then it means healthy body, healthy mind as well, of course. So, so that's, that's lovely. That's beautifully put, Father. Thanks very much. And Edith, when we were when we were preparing this, you know, I, I spoke to you all at length on the phone and we great chats, like we had brilliant chats. And you were talking about, you know, your daily walk and and using it to kind of um, pick up rubbish along the way. Will you share that story and kind of explain why it's important for you to talk about just even that simple thing? Yeah, oh, but there is no there is no, no simple thing or there is nothing too small. I think that um, the smallest things often indicate much bigger problems or much more, um, they're quite telling, you know, little things that we might take for granted, you know, in both ways, in beauty and gorgeous things in nature, but also when you see, you know, a can of coke in the, in the ditch, what's really going on there? So, um, yeah, when, when I had my baby, life slowed down then as well. I used to get her out in the pram walker every day and we live in a gorgeous part of the world. We're about, I think it's about seven minutes from the service station at the motorway. And it turns out that's as much time as it takes to eat a snack box. <laughs> so there's a total pattern here. As soon as we, um, we walked down the road and I was enjoying my lovely walk and then I just decided, oh look, I'll bring it back. And there's no point in giving out and stepping over the stuff. Just pick it up as you go. I know this is total end of pipe. It seems totally crazy. We should really sort the source of the problem, but it does, it helps to go up at problems from top down, bottom up, inside out. So yeah, in my mind, I was getting a picture of who was doing this in my head and there they are. They're really, they're polluting themselves. So why would they care about the environment? And again, one is the other, they are the same thing. So they're not even taking the time to sit and eat it. It's dashboard eating. It's fast, 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 go, 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 out the window, no regard for themselves or for what's going on outside of them. And like with the whole yoga thing, it's that we're starting with a place of getting to know yourself and being comfortable within yourself and loving yourself and caring for yourself. And if we all did that little bit, that's where it starts to ripple outwards. And there's no point in me pointing the finger at that person in the car and saying, Jesus, aren't they terrible? It's like, yeah, but what have I ever done in that regard? I've worked in fast food restaurants in my life. I've eaten my first year to prepare fast food. I remember going to Father Paddy once, well, more than once. <laughs> but he had a lovely um, quote. He said, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Yeah. So nobody is, nobody is holier than thou. Nobody is, we are all literally in this whole thing together. And something so small as litter, fast food in the ditch, that shows a huge myriad of problems going on there for a person physically, mentally, emotionally. How are they? Are they okay? And then I was finding an awful lot of cigarettes. Okay, they're smoking a lot. They're drinking an awful lot of sugar. They're eating an awful lot of fast food. They're um, taking painkillers, like nothing but painkillers in the ditch as well. And then I started to feel really guilty for feeling angry because it's like, are they okay? Yeah. So then I was like, what do you do with this? It's just 
crazy. It's just an indicator of so many things that have gone wrong in our society. If people think that this is a way to nourish yourself and to mind yourself is to stop at a service station or not even stop, drive through, get your takeaway, drive out the country to a beautiful area, throw it out the window and then wait for the crazy lady to come along with the buggy. <laughs> you know, it's just madness. Like. Yeah. You know, one tiny thing can show a whole net of problems on a much bigger scale you know it's the same way like you look into a population of river you see trout you know that's a healthy river if you see something missing there it's a it's a whole indicator of loads of other things so um so like what can we how do we start you know because obviously you're you're committed now you're sat and simon who run the yoga retreat you're, you've you've really figured this out but for a lot of us who you know um we're so busy like what can you tell us how do you start that journey? Just even a, a very simple thing that we can do to help us start and just build that awareness back again into ourselves, our bodies, and also of nature. Well, I suppose it's, it's, it's every day is a microcosm of your life. And every one of us is a microcosm in the whole, or every one of us are a cell in Mother Earth. Hopefully not a parasite, hopefully a healthy cell. <laughs> we can have this symbiotic relationship with nature and we can all flourish and thrive together. We have everything we need. We don't need to be rescued from above. We don't need, we have all the technology. We have everything we need and we have everything within us right now. But the fact is that we are so busy and we're so caught up in trying to keep up that we've lost that connection to ourselves. We've lost that connection to nature. And it starts from the first thing when you open your eyes in the morning to the last thing you do at night. And it's the simple daily practices and it's how we choose to live our lives and how conscious we are in our lives or how completely absent-minded we are. So a lot of people, most people, wake up to the sound of a horrible alarm or just jump out of bed and straight away turn on the phone, turn on the TV, turn on the whatever. And they're not actually taking a moment, which I'm not doing right now, so I'm nervous. It's green. <laughs> <laughs> just to take one conscious breath and say good morning how are you how am I right now before I start getting the whole world coming into me can I check in how am I in myself right now what do I need to do to maybe mind myself a little bit better today so could I just kick it down from fifth to maybe second year like Father Paddy says or could I just take a minute to stop just stop and breathe it's the simple, simple things like it's wonderful to get to a yoga class and do a sweaty hour and a half of practice, but that's only, you know, the icing on the cake. The, the little things, the real bread and butter, the root stuff is to slow down, to be a bit more present, to breathe. <laughs> and to make conscious decisions for yourself that are good for you. When you are doing stuff that is good for you, it's going to naturally have a ripple effect on your external environment. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, thanks, Danish. Okay. And um, going more back into our, our science kind of minds, Eric, um, you, you really have a very interesting uh, profession, I have to say. And, and uh, when we were talking, you were talking about different breeds of animals who, who have been affected by climate change across the globe. Can you just give us a, can you give us a taste? I'm sure that your brain is full of all these facts, but uh, we'd love to know a little bit more about what you have discovered in your work. I can, and if, if you'll allow me, I'll share some pictures. Cause Ooh, pictures, oh, leaving search power session. Pictures of thousands, as they say. Lovely. So hopefully you can see that now. Yeah. And I've, I just have three points to make, really. The first is that climate change does affect animals' health and people's health, consequently, but in very uneven ways. So this is a village uh, in Malawi. It's one of the, the many places we work. And most of the people in this picture will be small holder farmers. And you won't find a climate change skeptic amongst them because I know it's nice to live close to nature, but these uh, people live a little bit too close to nature in the sense that there's no buffer. There's no buffer between climate change and them. So it's quite common to get crop failure, uh, but now they're seeing it for different reasons and more frequently. Drought, you get crop failure. Flooding, you get crop failure. Locust, you get crop failure. And this is happening more and more frequently. So I was there uh, in what they call the hunger season where the crops are not ready to harvest yet, uh, but last year's stores have run out and it's, it's normal not to eat every day. And if you get uh, the crops failing, you're in big trouble. We think we have problems. Uh, so most of these farmers will, will buffet that by owning two or three goats. And then having a healthy goat to sell in case of extremes uh, when the crops fail, is the difference between you being able to pay a hospital bill 
or send the children to school. And if, if the goat is not healthy, that's a problem. Unfortunately, climate change is shifting uh, the dial towards the parasites here. They like the warm, humid conditions. There's one uh, called Humongous that, that uh, lives in the stomach and sucks the blood. And you can, you can see that this goat is getting very pale because of this uh, parasite. And there's very little that farmers can do. They can't afford to treat all the animals with drugs. They can't even get hold of the chemicals, but they do have plants around them that will suppress the parasites. They just don't have enough for all the animals. So what we do is model the impacts of climate change. We try to guide them in their decisions. We work on simple kind of intervention tools like this, and we help them identify which plants are gonna be mo most useful. As you move towards wealthier farmers in wealthier countries, but even within places like Malawi, as you get more resources and more obstacles between you and climate change and more uh, means to help out, then you get um, more skeptical about climate change because it doesn't affect you directly in the same way. The Sorry. second point I, I want to make is that we also work in wildlife. And um, there again, we're seeing some very strange things. So this is an antelope called the Saiger antelope that I've, I've worked with for more than 20 years. And it was critically endangered. It was the fastest decline in any mammal population ever, but they turned it around. And actually it was the fastest increase in any red listed mammal population ever. Until a few years ago, um, more than half of them died very suddenly. So here you see on the, the top right, uh, a picture of the steppe, the endless steppe with the saigas grazing. And this would be an aggregation of 80,000 animals that all came together to calve one spring and they all died, they all died within a week. So half of the world's population disappeared from this disease uh, in just a couple of weeks. And this happened in a year that was unusually warm, but it was the most humid spring ever recorded. And outbreaks like this have happened a couple of times before in warm, humid weather. And what happened was that you've got a, a bacterial species that lives in this, this wonderful pendulous nose here. And in very humid conditions, it seems it can invade and cause a hemorrhagic septicemia. And, and this uh, kind of mortality. So we're involved in, um, in working on this and it's probably the only time actually I've, I've been called a boffin. <laughs> uh, but it's not just in Saigas. So uh, this year there have been, uh, well, a smaller scale in terms of numbers, but elephants are pretty big animals. You know, it's big animal examples. That's much bigger than an elephant. There are hundreds of elephants found dead in Botswana. Uh, here on the water hole, some of these water holes are an odd color. It's, uh, it, there is algal bloom there. Uh, it's very difficult to investigate this under COVID when you can't get experts to the field and you have to kind of organize helicopters and water sampling from, from the other side of the world. But these things are happening. Something very strange is happening with wildlife disease. Why should we care? I mean, it's a very strange question to ask to a group of people who are probably very invested in nature and conservation, but it's a question I, asked, I get asked a lot. Why should we care about this? It's all very sad for the elephants and tigers. I tell you what, I haven't been asked that question since March. So this is a wet market in Laos. We, we were there hunting a rat lungworm that infects snails. And if people eat the infected snails, the parasite goes to the brain and causes coma. Uh, the gentleman in the foreground there is, is Rob Cowie from Hawaii. There was an outbreak of this in Hawaii. There were outbreaks in Laos. We're trying to find out the, the reasons for this. And just last year, this parasite was found for the first time in Europe. So this is One Health Global. I mean, I don't need to labor that point, I don't think. But climate uh, change is linked to a lot of these unusual events in livestock and in wildlife uh, and even in people. And we should sit up and take notice. Oh, my gosh. And, um, and then following on from that, you know, when we were talking together, I was saying to us, give us some hope, Eric. Give us something. Give us something positive. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, like myself, you, you, you believe that science will prevail and, and it will help. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, unsurprisingly, that's what I think, because that's the game I'm in. But uh, sometimes I get asked also, well, if, if this is happening, why isn't the world falling around around us? We've got a very farming dependent economy here. Why aren't we seeing these mass uh, outbreaks and deaths? Well, it's because we have chemicals that are still more or less effective and drugs we give the animals that mask these effects. Unfortunately, those are giving way. Uh, there's resistance in these drugs. And, and although most farmers don't realize it, they're using drugs that aren't fully effective. Beneath that, we're seeing big changes in the patterns of infection. This is a parasite that infects lambs. It can cause diarrhea in lambs. It can kill up to 10% of a lamb crop. And it, it hatches in spring. And that used to be a very regular as clockwork event. 
Now it's much more variable. It can happen over a seven or eight week period. But we've done the science. We've investigated this worm and we can warn people. So we produce now, mainly for the UK, a daily map that shows when the risk gets high. And then farmers and advisors can, can um, treat at a very precise time. This wasn't possible a few years ago. We also are getting a better appreciation for what nature can do for us in controlling these parasites. Earthworms, dung beetles have valuable roles to play. We often um, blame the environment here. You've got a boggy field, which is probably riddled with liver pollute, but it's probably because that land might be put to better use, actually. Uh, wildflowers there. A lesson we've learned from Africa, you look around at local plants and you find there's a lot there that can be used in mixed meadows and mixed swords in more targeted ways that take away the need for all of these chemicals in the environment. So there is hope and there's plenty of science going on to, to try to find those solutions. Thank you very much. And thanks for, thanks for sharing those slides. So, so you know, for you long term, what, what, what do you want to see change with our behaviours? As what, what can we do to influence all that as humans? Well, I think individual action is key, but I think sometimes there's too much onus placed on individuals leading busy lives to try to take the, the hit on all of this. And sometimes policy gets in the way. So uh, you could look at uh, things like agricultural policy and say, uh, are we really doing the best with the land for the, the, the public good? Uh, and that's, I suppose, where we work top down to try to make um, a, a policy environment where it's easier for people to make a contribution uh, without making... Um, the sorts of big sacrifices to, to their lifestyles that they're being asked to make all the time. Not that we shouldn't try, but yeah. I think sometimes it feels like we're swimming against the tide on this and uh, yeah. there's more to be done to, to help us help the planet. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Eric. And, and kind of shoehorning onto that, Ailish, then, you know, on a, on a human, you know, on a personal level, it's all very overwhelming. <laughs> You know, what I find with people who are interested in, in, in doing something about climate change, when they watch the big nature programs and they, you know, they hear, you know, what Sir David Attenborough has to say and everything. Sometimes it can feel there and not here. And it can be very overwhelming for people to go, how can I change icebergs, uh, you know, in, in the Arctic regions? What can I do? And, you know, something that came up last night, but we said we tackle it tonight instead was the notion around climate anxiety. There's a lot of people of the, you know, the younger generation who feel the onus of um, making a positive um, and effective change on the planet but that but with that comes great responsibility and that responsibility gives them anxiety so how can we make this topic feel less overwhelming for people i know that's a big question but in your field of expertise what what would you advise we do mm. yeah well anxiety is too much future tense in a negative way you know and especially, I, I kind of noticed it myself in younger kids as well, because they're sensitive and they're bombarded with all of this information. And they do feel like, geez, have the adults just checked out on this and they don't care? A lot of adults do care, <laughs> not all. And um, I don't think that, I do think that, yes, if, if there was a child sitting in front of me, I'd say, absolutely, you, you matter. Absolutely, every decision you make, every choice you make is really important and has a big impact. And so does everybody else's. It's not all entirely on your shoulders and we are all are in this together and there is a lot of help and a lot of support. And the more that you are sensitive, that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing that people are sensitive and that care. And it, like sometimes it feels like, and sometimes you can be the only one in your family that feels that way as well. And more often than not, it is the case, but still fight that good fight. <laughs> and there is a lot of support there. But as well as that, um, thinking again more in terms of for children and younger children who are really experiencing this in a negative way is um yeah you're not on your own with it and don't forget that life is big and beautiful and humans are amazing and can do anything and we have gone maybe in the wrong direction of course but sometimes you need to go like a pendulum swing the wrong way and then swing the back again to find that middle ground to find that balance and that's where we're heading for is this balance in life and we all have a part to play in this we are all different polarities but all together we can find that middle ground and we can live a beautiful life and for kids to really be kids as well not to take on the whole weight of the world on your shoulders to enjoy nature the beauty of it the beauty of animals the beauty of everything and to value yourself as much as you would value a polar bear. You're just as important as any polar bear. <laughs> you know, we're all important. Everybody has 
a really important role to play in all of it. And um, I think everything is possible, you know? Look at what this year has shown us. She's yeah. like, we've completely changed our way of living entirely. If anybody told us this this time last year, we would have thought it was a messed up episode of Black Mirror and you wouldn't have believed the word of it. Yeah. But it's, look at how much we've changed our way of being. And now we have this opportunity. It's like, right, we are completely gone back into our cocoons. We're metamorphosizing, we're changing. Where do we go from here? I think that after the first lockdown, we went straight back into the normal way of living. I, I think the cars were back up 80 or 90 percent within a week. It's like I thought lots of people would be checking out and staying at home after this and find, choosing their new ways of living. But um, no, so unfortunately, as humans, we need to hear a lesson more than once. So here we are again in lockdown two, lockdown three, if you're in, in Leash and Opley and Blair. So where are we going from here again? Let's, especially now because it's winter, to really slow down and really evaluate how do we want to move from here in our lives, all of us. It's not the responsibility of the Greens. It's not the responsibility of the government. It's not the responsibility of any one set of people. It's not certain politicians going to say that are ruinous. It's all of us. And it's, again, top down, bottom up, inside out. But it starts with us. Lovely. Thank you. And, and Father Paddy, you know, it's kind of the same question to you. And, you know, um, again, you, you're meeting people all the time. And I'm sure, you know, um, you have to think of practical ways that we can improve our mental health while connecting with nature. So, so what practical ways would you advise on top of what Anish has told us to to stay healthy and, and relying on that, as you say, that connection that you began with at the top with that lovely hyacinth beside you? How do we how do we maximize that? Ailish really sort of has articulated so very well and so very real. Um, and as she was speaking, I was thinking of a great environmentalist and Irish poet, Patrick Kavanagh, mm. and Wax's beautiful lyrics about nature. And I love the one about the month of December in the Christian calendar. It's the season of Advent. It's a, it's a time of pregnancy about to give birth to a new opportunity. And he wrote a lovely few lines, he said, but here in this Advent darkened room where the dry black bread of penance will charm back the luxury of a child's soul, the knowledge we lost but could not use. And what did he mean? He meant that regrettably, you know, there is a, there is a restriction, there is that lovely image of, of we are in a cathartic moment for humanity. And I think hopefully uh, what my word and my word is always to me first, because uh, authenticity comes from trying to live our advice uh, instead of naming it, try to claim it and own it. Uh, I find the struggle of me in the complexity of my humanity anyway is to be present to this moment and to 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 try. And, and it's wonderful to grow into it, to not be burdened by yesterday, not to be overwhelmed by tomorrow, because there's such beauty in this present moment, in the gift of today, in the, in the ability. A lady phoned me, a friend of mine, and said, Godfather Paddy, is it just me? Or I've never seen as many leaves fallen from the trees this November. And I just said to her with, with, with great joy, I said, no, do you know what it is, Mary, is we have time to actually enjoy them. Yeah. And Whilst we can be, and I agree with what Eilish was saying, I was hoping, and I'm a, I'm a firm optimist, and thankfully very naive, but um, I, was, I was really excited coming out of lockdown. I said, oh, thank God, everything is going to be... We're all going to want to talk, and we're going to be more calmer. And then I remember just when lockdown came back, it was the 29th of June, I had to go to a home store and more in Port Leash, and I got out of the car, took a deep breath, totally on a high. And this guy nearly ploughed into me, bipping the horn, move on, move on. And I just said, God, so as a human being, it takes time to learn. But please, those who are engaging with us. And I speak to myself, in order to learn, we have to experience the need for that cathartic change. And I think that Mother Nature is saying to us, as what Eric was so wonderfully outlining in the science of it, we need healing. And mm -hmm. in that healing, we're going to become healthier. And in a healthier living manner, we're going to make our humanity even, even more beautiful. 
even more inspirational than than what we have had uh, to 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 be gifted with because we must be grateful. So I think there's good news here. I think we're entering 2021 humbly. I believe it's going to be the most majestic spring that perhaps we may ever have encountered, that when those leaves that have fallen, when that green shoots and buds and nature awakens in 2021, please God, I pray genuinely for me and for you that we will, we will be well and Mother Nature will be honoured more and more. And very finally, I, my mammy used to teach us at home about this. I grew up in a big family. My grandmother reared 14 children and we were very much conscious coming up to Christmas of food and food wastage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one third of what we purchase is dumped every week. Uh, I think it's a practical thing. Um, uh, we, we, we live in a time when, unfortunately, in, a, in, in, in our consumerism, that we purchase too much and to be very careful on, the, a bit on what we are eating in terms of the, 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 the complete sense of just dumping out food that we can actually save and maintain. So be careful around the throwing out of food. I think it's a practical thing with the weeks ahead. And whilst we all enjoy a good feed, it's important to nourish, but it's also important to conserve the food we have. Yeah, very true, very true. We've, we've looked at this, you know, in, in many different ways tonight on, on health and, um, and thanks so much for your contributions so far. Let's just check in now with Catherine to see if there have been any questions coming through on, on Facebook um, or, or through email. Catherine, what have you, have you, how have you found the community to engage with us tonight in terms of their questions? We've had a few comments um, from people enjoying particularly what Father Paddy said, I think drawing together there the spirituality and the science definitely resonated with people. Um, one of the questions we had in earlier on by email was somebody who commented they were delighted to see Father Paddy on the panel this evening and they were saying that there wasn't enough said about Laudate Si, um, Pope Francis's book um, on climate action or on, on nature, which talked about how we need to take urgent action to reduce carbon dioxide emissions or to avoid profound environmental and social consequences. I wonder, Paddy, I know that's a big that's a big topic to take on this evening, but could you say a bit, bit about that maybe in the context of what we're talking about this evening? Well, again, I think the core of Laudatio Si, and I'd invite everybody, I mean, it's available on the internet just to, to digest it, but what he's saying is it's about wellness, well-being, and uh, I think Francis himself embodies the sense of being proactive around care of self and care of environment. Uh, it's another issue, perhaps for another time. And Ayler spoke about young people and anxiety. I uh, really welcome his words to the um, LGBT community last week in terms of at least putting out there that, you know, we are all created in a beautiful way and that everybody, everybody is sacred. But particularly in Laudat, you see there's some very practical ways we on the ground in our community in Abbey Leaks, Bally Roan, wherever you are, Bally Finn, we can own our action for a greater sense of care of the environment. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Nicely put, Father. Okay, anything else, Catherine, coming in? Yeah, we just have a question in from, from Robbie, who I think I'm um, probably best is, uh, directed towards Ailish, uh, from Robbie Quinn. If you could write a letter to your younger self, what small piece of advice would you give in dealing with climate action and health? It's lovely, lovely question. Oh, uh, my younger self was a bit of a, a Greta, Robbie, so I'd say she wouldn't have needed the letters. I'd tell her to calm down a bit. I think that when we're younger, um, yeah, I was an environmental scientist in, a, in my earlier life, and I think that, um, oh God, the idealism of youth, we really do burn ourselves out trying to fight that good fight, and we're not balanced, and we're not... Being, you know, we're not enjoying our youth and enjoying the beauty of youth and all the wonderfulness that comes with that. Again, it's that onus of it's not all on your shoulders, little ales, <laughs> lighten up, enjoy life. And I think that when I was younger, as for a lot of young people who might have the climate anxiety, I totally get it, totally relate to it. Um, my sister Maureen had a t-shirt when we were kids because it was all, Greenpeace was very hip in the 90s and saving the whales. She had a little t-shirt and it has, had a whale on it and a little thought bubble saying save the humans. <laughs> so I think that when you're younger, you kind of think that the environment is more important than the humans. It's not. The environment is very important and so are the humans and we're here um, to, to grow and evolve together as one and we're here to benefit each other and to really 
evolve. So um, little ales lighten up, love the planet, love your neighbours and love yourself. That's what I would say next nice week. <laughs> lovely, lovely Eilish. And uh, Catherine, anything else then? Anyone? Yeah, I suppose in the context of loving the humans, somebody on, on email also wanted to know a bit about the, the from Eric, some of the parasites that might affect people in Ireland and maybe how they might be affected by, by climate change. So Eric, that's to you. You're on mute at the moment. I don't know if you heard that question. Yeah, I did hear it. Sorry. Uh, I'm just not sure you want to hear the answer, to be honest with you. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> There are certainly parasites in fact uh, people one of the most concerning is probably um, roundworms in dogs which which can um, migrate in people and that can cause uh, difficulties in cognitive development also clinical problems which are quite underestimated so I suppose it plays to Eilish's point uh, indirectly about, about littering and care for the environment and um, uh, particularly pollution with dog waste and inadequate treatment of dogs so, uh, you know, that's, that's probably a parasite that's having an impact on our community. And I know um, Abelix Bog, for example, has been quite proactive in trying to make sure that people do share space uh, with dogs, with people responsibly and, and have a net positive effect on health and not introduce any negative effects. Mm, gosh, that is interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, I think, we, I think we, we've kind of run out of time. What I might do at the end, Father, is um, at the very, very end, maybe you might just take us through some sort of tiny little meditation to help us sort of uh, end our session on on a on something that we can do together but let me just wrap up a few things first if that's okay so you can have a think about that if that's all right and um, it's always important to thank the people that make this happen so in the background we have Gillian Monsell from the Midland Science Festival who's been taking pictures and promoting it on social media so thank you very much Gillian over on the Facebook page we have had the amazing Anne Lawler from um, Creative Leash and she's been keeping an eye on Facebook to make sure everything is working fine and of course in here in the Zoom room the amazing Catherine Casey keeps everything going so thank you very much Catherine and indeed to all my um, colleagues involved in the Climate Action project and the people involved in it and you know the tidy towns and and the bog project and the people like yourselves that I meet tonight but everybody that I meet is just so encouraging to see people care so much in a community um, around the Leash region and it gives me tremendous hope as somebody on the outside looking in and you've made my job as science communicator and residents very easy so thank you for that and um, we want you to get involved the whole purpose of these sessions is that we want to hear from you we want to know what it is that can help you feel part of, of nature again and, and, and part of being able to handle climate action in a way that feels feasible because these people that we talk to on these panels they've got a handle on it and it's our job to help you get a handle on it so we have a dedicated email address which is climateaction at leashcoco.ie so please get in touch with any of your questions or if you want to get involved in any way please do we have our third and final panel happening this Saturday and it's all about climate action and the quality of life and again we have four people on, on our panel um, for that and it's well worth checking out so come back again to our Facebook page at 7pm and um, all that's really left for me to say is, is to thank really most sincerely um, Eric uh, for your fantastic insights uh, from a scientist and from a human uh, living in the area and on, um, on, on a global level as well thank you so much for those it's, it's enlightening to hear that there is hope through science and Adish you know you're always an absolute pleasure to speak to thank you very much for being part of our fast facts as well and you always um you always break it down into such a human level um and you make me you remind me to be nicer to myself and to think more about um self-reflection at the top of every morning and i will take what you mentioned on board and father paddy sure you're 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 a diamond i only know you a few weeks and already you've 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 managed to capture my heart, as I'm sure you have in the whole of the community. And I'm not surprised you make such an impact on people. So it's apt that you take us out and, and say something, as I know only you can, to give us uh, a nice bit of an end to tonight and help us move forward in our capacity to love the climate as much as ourselves. And I think, you know, to say on behalf of all of us, thanks to you. You have a lovely charism and a lovely way of putting people at ease. And I do value that, and we all do. Um, for some reason, I, I'm a big uh, fan of the, the mantra. The mantra is something that connects all humanity, be what for whatever creed or no creed. It's a way of centering and focusing when it comes to uh, allowing your energy and the energy that comes from wherever 
to flow in a positive way. And my personal mantra, I'd say this every morning, evening and night, and it just brings me and perhaps all of us into a place of calm. I, I use it every day and it's a very simple one. It is spirit of God, loving and free. Spirit of God, flow through me. Now you can change that to wherever you are in relation to faith or wherever, but I do think it's a very powerful one. It's about the spirit of God, loving and free, that that will anoint us with hope and indulge us in times that are challenging with the capacity to be present. And we, no matter where, what's going on, all we have is the beauty of now and in that sacred place to find peace and hope. Amen. Yeah, thank you very much. Good night, everybody. See you on Saturday and, and happy Science Week.